We want revolutionary actuaries. <laughs> hey, this is Warren Redlick. Really exciting quarter two report. I want to talk a tiny bit about the numbers for the quarter, but mostly I'm going to focus on that great roadmap Elon and the Tesla team set out for us for Tesla's future. Are you ready? Let's go. Think about the next, the next 12 to 18 months, uh, we'll have three new factories in place. Things are looking great with uh, Giga Berlin. What we'll have Cybertruck, Semi, Roadster, full self-driving. There's so much to be excited about. And then, of course, there's Factory Day, which is you know, coming up. That's really going to surprise people by, by just how, how much there is to see. Really quick on the numbers, Tesla reported a profit. Great news. Probably going to lead to S&P 500 inclusion. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of deal, detail on the numbers. You can check out HyperChange has a great video where he talks about the numbers. We were able to achieve a fourth consecutive prof profitable quarter. Um, and although the automotive industry was down about 30% year over year in the first half of the year, uh, we managed to grow deliveries in the first half of the year. One particular number I want to talk about is regulatory credit revenue. Tesla's getting some heat from some analysts saying, hey, that shouldn't count or that's some sort of unfair revenue. The practical reality is they're getting regulatory credit revenue by playing on the playing field that's there and that revenue is growing. This is good news, not bad news. People are trying to spin it the wrong way. But listen to what Zach Kirkhorn has to say. And right after Zach, that's when it starts. Regulatory credit revenue increased sequentially to 428 million. While difficult to forecast precisely, our best estimate of 2020 credit revenue is roughly double that of 2019. Our cash balance increased to our highest level yet of 8.6 billion, which included free cash flows of over 400 million. Did you catch that? Cash balance of $8.6 billion, the highest ever. Tesla's got a big pile of cash. That's great news for the business. Next is the big news. Tesla will be building a new factory in Austin, Texas. It will be an ecological paradise and a great place to work. Check out what Elon has to say about that and more coming. We're also very excited to announce that we're going to be building our next gigafactory in Texas is going to be uh, right near Austin. The location is five minutes from Austin International Airport and 15 minutes from downtown Austin. And it's about 2,000 acres, a factory that is going to be stunning. It's right on the Colorado River. So we're actually going to have, we're going to have a boardwalk uh, where there will be a hiking, biking trail. It's going to basically be an ecological paradise. Birds in the trees, butterflies, fish in the stream, and it will be open to the public as well. What? Is Tesla going to make in this huge new factory? Elon is going to tell you, and it's going to be good. We'll be doing Cybertruck there, the Tesla Semi, and we'll be doing Model 3 and Y for the uh, eastern half of North America. We've already started work on the facility, so some initial construction work, so it's, it's already underway, started this weekend. It's already underway? How many vehicles can Tesla produce in Texas? Well, right now, zero. <laughs> um, but uh, long term, a lot. Our biggest property. What you just heard was an analyst question and a short answer. How many vehicles will it produce? A lot. And then quietly, another Tesla team member said, it's our biggest property. Our biggest property. This factory is going to make Cybertruck. It's going to make Semi. It's going to make Model 3 and Model Y for the East Coast and it may make future vehicles. They didn't mention that. It is reasonable to expect with the size of this facility that in the long run, it will make half a million to a million cyber trucks a year. The volume of semi will be fairly small because that's a low volume vehicle, but they'll make 10,000 or more a year, who knows? Model 3 and Model Y between them should be another million vehicles a year. We could easily see this factory producing 2 million vehicles a year in two or three years, if not sooner. A quick note here about California. They're not going anywhere. Elon was unhappy with California during the, the Alameda County shutdown, but it appears that California will continue to make Tesla vehicles, including the Roadster. Here's what he We will continue to grow in California, uh, so, but we expect California to, to do Model S and X for worldwide consumption uh, and 3 and Y for the western half of North America. Um, and then we think probably also, the Tesla Roadster, uh, a future program, would also make sense uh, in California. Elon was really excited about the progress with full self-driving. He talked about it in his own vehicle. 
He talked about the future. You're going to hear about full self-driving in this video multiple times. Here's the first one. I personally test the latest alpha build of the full self-driving software when I, when I drive my car, and it is really, I think, profoundly better than people realize. It's almost getting to the point where I, I can go from my house to work with no interventions, despite going through construction and widely varying uh, situations. This is why I, I'm very confident about full self-driving functionality uh, being complete by the end of this year, because I'm literally driving it. He said it again. Full self-driving will be feature complete by the end of this year. Next is a great question about future Tesla vehicles. Elon didn't really give a straight answer, but it's pretty clear that in the future, Tesla will be doing a more compact vehicle. I think a compact utility vehicle, and I made a video about that recently, and Tesla will also probably make something like a minibus, and I'll be making a video about that soon. As Tesla continues its journey towards the long-term goal of selling 20 million units per year, what are the most important vehicle programs that will drive volume growth over the next three to five years beyond Model 3, Y, and the Cybertruck? Cheaper, smaller versions of 3 and Y, or region-specific vehicles, or anything else? Well, I don't think we can comment on, you know, our detailed product roadmap beyond what's announced, because I think we'd, we want to reserve that for product launches. But it would be reasonable to assume that we would make uh, a compact vehicle of some kind, you know, and, and probably a, a higher capacity passenger vehicle of some kind. Uh, you know, it's, th these are likely things at some point. I think we'll do the, the obvious things. Next is a really good question about software. A lot of people talk about software going in Tesla vehicles. Elon and Zach and the team are very clear that the self-driving software is the huge, huge revenue and profit source of the future, that other software options that might come along might be interesting, they might be fun, they're working on it, but it's really all about self-driving. I hear that in what they're saying. I feel like other people don't get it. What is your vision for software at Tesla? What opportunities do you see for monetizing the installed base other than by FSD? And right now, by far, by far FSD is just overwhelmingly the most important thing. You know, I think the, the upgrading of the fleet to full self-driving, essentially with an over-the-air software update, I mean, may go down as the, the, the biggest asset value increase in history. As, as a step change, you know, a few million cars suddenly becoming five times more valuable or suddenly five times higher utility. You know, they go from like 12 hours a week of utility, something like that, or that's how many hours they're used, uh, to 60, something like that. Everything else is pretty small by comparison. Now, when things do become full self driving, so what are people going to do in the car? Well, I guess they're probably going to do productivity and entertainment of some kind. You know, watch movies, play games, and do work. You know, FSD remains by far and away the biggest opportunity in the near term. But we're putting the plumbing in place to um, be ready to scale other areas when the time is right. So premium connectivity subscription is something that we've put in place. Uh, and the ability to upgrade your vehicle through the app, for example, on acceleration boost, or upgrading a standard range Model 3 to a standard plus, adding rear heated seats. So these are things that uh, we have, and we're continuing to get feedback from the field and other things that we can launch, and we'll trickle those in with time. Yeah, yeah. But, but they're all very tiny compared with, like, the tri like the, the step change to full self-driving, depending upon how you calculate it, is probably worth you know, at least $100,000 per car. So that's a lot of software you have to sell. This step change that Elon is talking about is a huge, huge deal. Imagine this. There's going to be, let's say, 3 million Tesla cars on the road with FSD, and Tesla is going to flick a switch. There will be an over-the-air download that night, and 3 million cars will suddenly be worth $100,000 more apiece. $100,000 more apiece. 3 million times 100,000 is $300 billion of value unlocked sometime next year. Next is a really insightful question about self-driving milestones. I don't think Elon really answered it the way I would have liked him to answer it. Instead of talking about, you know, different aspects of driving that the software will accomplish, 
he really focused on the milestone of the foundational rewrite that is going to take the fundamental software from 2 or 2.5D analysis to four-dimensional analysis, looking at individual pictures stitching them together, going from that to looking at four-dimensional video, surround video with time, and being able to analyze that and how much that's going to prove it. And keep in mind, Elon has that in his car already in the alpha build. It's already working. It's that close. What are the most important upcoming self-driving milestones, and how do you think about timing? The, the actual major milestone that's happening right now is, is really a transition of the autonomy system or the cars like AI, if you will, from thinking about things in, um, I call it like 2.5D. <laughs> Like think, think of, so it's basically taking like isolated pictures, um, and and doing image recognition on the, on pictures that are partially correlated in time, but not not very well, uh, and transitioning to kind of a 4, 4D where you know it's it's like your which is video essentially. You get you're thinking about the world in three dimensions, and the, the fourth dimension being time. So. That, that architectural change, which has been underway for some time, but has not really been rolled out to anyone in the production fleet, is what really matters for full self-driving. It's just hard to convey just how much better a fully 4D system would work. It does work. Um, it, it, it's capable of things that, it, that if, you, if you're just look, looking at things as individual pictures as opposed to video, like basically, like you could go from like individual pictures to uh, surround video. The car will seem to have just like a giant improvement. I know probably roll it out later this year, and then it will be a, a long march of n nines essentially. How how many nines of reliability? So it'll definitely be way better than human. But how much better than human does it need to be? That that, that that's actually going to be the real. Work. There's just a massive amount of work with each kind of order of magnitude of reliability. But you'll see, you'll see it happen, and if you plot the points on a curve, it'll be kind of obvious where it's headed. The people I see being the most strong about AI are the ones who are very smart, because they can't imagine that a computer could be way smarter than them. That, that's the flaw in their logic. They're just way dumber than they think they are. Next is another great question. The machine that builds the machine, the alien dreadnought all about manufacturing, a lot of great stuff in this answer from Elon and the Tesla team. Manufacturing is the key. This is a blast. Listen carefully. Please may you update us on Ilian Dreadnought. How has your thinking evolved and what is needed in order to get closer to fundamental physical limits? Well, we're putting a massive amount of effort into manufacturing engineering, the machine that makes the machine. There's probably 1,000%, maybe 10,000% more engineering required for the factory than for the, the product itself. We're certainly making making progress. I mean, battery and powertrain factory, Gigafactory Nevada is, you know, on an alien driven work version 0.5, something like that. So, you know, starting to approach version one. We're, we're getting way better at making cars. You can see that in Giga Shanghai. And you'll, you'll see that even more with, uh, with Berlin. Um, and, and we're really changing the design of the car in order to make it more manufacturable. The, the fundamental architecture of, of Model Y will be different in Berlin. It, it may look the same, but it, the internals will be quite different and fundamentally more efficient uh, architecturally than, than what we've done to date. I thought that was a really interesting point. The way they design the manufacturing affects the design of the product. That the Model Y that will be built in Berlin will be different than the Model Y currently being built in Fremont because they've updated their manufacturing techniques and processes and removed processes to make manufacturing better. This is an, a constant ongoing evolution within Tesla and it's great to hear that and there's a lot more coming right Part of the Alien Dreadnought concept is not just automation, but minimizing the number of process steps and complexity involved in the manufacturing system, which involves really integrating design and manufacturing across 
from like when the raw materials enter the factory to the finished goods exit. Yeah. Um, and, and we're learning so much through doing that. Yeah, vertical integration is extremely important for this. Yeah. Um, but the supply chain, if you, if, you, if you put like a GPS tracker on, on a molecule from when it got mined to when it was in a usable product, it would look insane. <laughs> like in, it's, it would be like, wow, it went around the world like six times. Um, so with vertical integration, maybe you can only go around the world once. You know, it's a huge improvement. Or not even like half a, only go half a, I think if you get vertical integration, it could probably get you an order of magnitude improvement. I think the, the focus for us is uh, um, in increasing the um, CapEx uh, efficiency. This is something that uh, uh, we've been working very hard uh, for the past three years. Um, and you can see that uh, we can build new factories for less amount of money and much faster. Yeah. Uh, those things go together. Um, yeah, it's a better it's a better factory for less money in less time. Yeah, less money means less time. Yeah. So that's uh, a, a great advantage. The point about CapEx efficiency, capital expenditure efficiency, is something I didn't understand before I really started following Tesla. And I feel like I mostly learned it from HyperChange. I really recommend the HyperChange channel if you're into that stuff. The key detail here is if you're able to make a factory for less money, and the factory is able to produce more, it's a better factory so it's able to produce more, you're spreading the cost of that factory over more models, over more vehicles. And then when you're figuring out how much to charge for a vehicle, the less capital expenditure that you had, the less goes into the vehicle and you can sell the vehicle for less money or you can make more money on that vehicle. CapEx is huge. And um, we're also reducing this, and it still is a lot, uh, the amount of inefficiencies. We want every operation to add value yeah. to the vehicle, mm, value meaning moving the atoms closer to their final state. You know, So we do yeah. not want any robot that just moves things. Yes, or, or, or a person. It, 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 yeah, like, yeah, it's in funny. fact, it's like we, we want to be super respectful of people's labor. If, yeah. we're, if we're asking somebody to do something, are we sure it's useful? Are, are we asking, asking them to spend their time in a way that is respectful of their time? Um, but, but, but it's like, wow, the potential for improvement is, is tremendous. And like, I just want to be clear, here at Tesla, we love manufacturing. It's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and I, I really think more smart people should be working on manufacturing. It's and we like, want more people. Yes, we, we exactly. can't find enough people. <laughs> we, we, yeah. we do. If people are interested in designing new lines and uh, trying to do things different, you know, Tesla's got a job for you. And now we've got jobs yeah. everywhere. It's not only in California. Yep. We've got jobs in China, in Berlin, in Austin, Texas, yeah. and in California. If you, uh, so there's plenty of uh, exciting places, and all these places will do original work and challenging yes. and meaningful work. Yeah. It, it, absolutely. Um, it, it, it's actually extremely exciting for, and fulfilling to design new production systems. Um, and I think that, you know, for some reason I kind of got a bad rap, especially in the U.S. for a long time. And, and I think people didn't think that manufacturing, sort of, they thought of manufacturing as like, oh, it's just bore, some boring, just making copies or whatever. But actually there's far more opportunity for innovation in manufacturing than in the product itself. Like if there's one thing that comes out of this call, it's like, Hey, if, if, if you want to help us invent amazing new manufacturing techniques um, and, and have input into the product itself, it's not like you just get tossed the product and say, hey, make this, this product and it's a kind of a lousy design. You'd get, if you're in manufacturing, you get to change the product design and say, hey, this, this product you're asking me to manufacture is dumb. <laughs> and they're like, great, let's fix it. It tells a if you work on manufacturing engineering, you don't just get force fed a toad sandwich. You, you get to change the product design. It's super exciting. And, and we evolved the lines uh, even after they're built, they, this rapid evolution of the production system. And there's nothing more rewarding than going from zero cars an hour to yeah. 5,000 cars a week or 1,000 cars a day. Long term sustainable advantage of Tesla, I think, will be uh, manufacturing. Elon also gave an update on what's happening with Tesla solar, solar roof products, solar panels for your roof or the actual solar roof. Have a listen. We recently adjusted the pricing of our retrofit solar. Uh, so Tesla solar is the lowest cost solar in the United States. Uh, and we added a lowest, lowest cost guarantee and a money back guarantee. So we're very confident that people will, will have our solar product, whether it's the solar retrofit or solar roof. Our solar is now 30% cheaper than the US average. After the federal, federal tax credit, uh, Tesla Solar now costs 
$1.49 per watt. It's a very simple, highly automated, single-click experience. Think about uh, Tesla, whether you want a new roof or Tesla solar roof, or you want solar on your existing roof. Either way, we're the company to go to. And then you can also get a power wall and have energy independence and, and be your own utility. I think that product is really coming together, um, and it's only going to get better later this year. Tesla Energy seems widely ignored by Wall Street, despite Elon, <laughs> despite Elon comments about growth rate exceeding automotive. Could Tesla share more detail on current or planned projects to help investors better understand the business outlook? How disruptive is Tesla's auto bidder technology? Yeah, well, I, I, I can't emphasize enough. I think long-term Tesla Energy will be roughly the same size as Tesla Automotive. I mean, the energy business collectively is bigger than the automotive business. How, how big is the energy sector? Bigger than automotive. In order to achieve a sustainable energy future, we have to have sustainable energy generation, which I think is going to be primarily solar followed by wind. And, and those are intermittent, so you need to have a lot of batteries to store the energy because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. So there's like three elements of the sustainable energy future. Wind and solar, sustainable energy generation, uh, battery storage, and electric transport, those three things. Um, and the mission of Tesla is to accelerate sustainable energy. Battery and solar will both be enormous, um, and they kind of have to be in order for us to have a sustainable future. Uh, and we've got a great product roadmap on that front. We've been shipping the Megapack. It's very well received. Megapack is, has represented itself and, and is uh, an integrated, rapidly deployable, you know, grid-tied storage battery of mega, megawatt-hour scale. Um, uh, we're working with utilities, large and small, you know, not just utilities, but also just like microgrid and project developers of all type and building our own um, projects where it makes sense. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot of demand for the product and we're growing the production uh, rates as, as fast as we can for that product. Real quick, that was big, that Tesla Energy is expected to become as big or bigger than Tesla Automotive. Plain and simple, the energy sector is bigger than the auto sector, so it's reasonable to expect that. Coming up, they're going to talk about AutoBidder, very interesting software that helps manage the use of things like Megapack and PowerPack and Powerwall with the grid. And then on AutoBidder, AutoBidder is, is basically autopilot for grid-tied batteries. It's an autonomous energy market participation system that, you know, does high-frequency trading and ensures... Well, that, that's a bad word. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> How should frequency trading should be called front running? Sorry, uh, we're not, not doing not that. Doing anything like that? No, it's, <laughs> it's ensuring that the battery is doing everything it can to manage the grid intermittency yes. of the renewals, renewables, and just grid intermittency of all kinds. I mean, you know, people turn their lights on and off, power plants turn on and off, yeah. factories ramp up and down, and batteries are great to so, to solve those problems. Yeah, it, it just it does grid stabilization, yeah. you know, at the millisecond level. Exactly. Uh, so. It, it just ensures that things are super smooth. Um, it's, it's like a, you know, a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply of enormous size. What about the ROUSs? Rodents of unusual size? I don't think they exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But just it just ensures that this the grid has smooth sailing, um, and then the, the the batteries, you know, the computers like all interact with each other and, and make sure that they're working together to make the grid uh, smooth. Um, and this can be done with the power walls and, and the mega packs and the power packs all working together um, and interacting with the party uh, systems as well. Yeah, centrally or distributed, it does both. And hey, for all you V2G people, there was another opportunity for them to talk about vehicle to grid and they didn't mention it. Power wall, power pack, mega pack, they didn't mention vehicle to grid. It's not happening. Sorry, Charlie. I mean, it's necessary in order to solve the sustainable energy problem. So. Yeah, you can't plan power plants on the hourly scale in a renewable world. You need to plan. You need to optimize them on a minute by minute scale, and that's what we're doing. The real limitation on Tesla growth is cell production at an affordable price. We're going to talk about a lot more about this on Battery Day um, because this is a fundamental scaling constraint, and and, and any part of that at that supply chain or processing of, uh, at the cell level will, will, will be the limiting factor. So, uh, you know, wh whatever it may be, um, anywhere from mining to refining, and there's many steps on the ref refining to, you know, cathode and anode formation, cell formation, uh, whatever the choke point is, that will set the, the growth rate.
We expect to expand our business with Panasonic, with CATL, with LG, possibly with others. And there's a lot more to say on that front on Battery Day. That's something you're going to see again and again with Tesla for years. They are battery constrained. This is the big problem. This is the big holdup that's keeping Tesla from growing even faster than they're already growing. It's all about the batteries. Another great question here, Tesla Semi. They're going to get into a lot of depth on Semi and on batteries. Uh, now that it's time to bring the Tesla Semi to volume production, can you share more detail on production plans? What weekly production rate is considered volume production and uh, when does Tesla expect to reach that rate? So we'll start production next year as we announced before. I'm personally very excited about the project. I can't wait. Uh, we do have a few trucks that keep driving around and that keep delivering cars, uh, but uh, we're going to accelerate that. I want to be clear that uh, the first few units uh, we will use ourselves, uh, Tesla, to carry our own freight, uh, probably mostly between Fremont and Reno, which is a fantastic test route. Uh, we want to prove that we have re really good reliability. I mean, so far, the early units do have it, but we'll, we'll do that at the larger scale. And we have also promised uh, some early units to some um, long-term, very patient and supportive customers, and we'll do that. Uh, now we have uh, more sales coming up in uh, next year, as uh, Elon just pointed out, so we can uh, increase uh, the um, uh, diversity of the portfolio. It didn't make sense up to now to do it, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, we'll be ready, and um, that's yeah, maybe a little biased. I'm very excited about this, and uh, we have a lot of very unique technology that we're always dreaming about that we will be putting into that semi. It will be just awesome. Yeah. Elon gets deeper into cell chemistry, lithium iron phosphate and nickel batteries. There's like two general classes of, of cell. There's like iron phosphate and then the nickel based. Uh, nic the nic nic nickel based cells have um, higher energy density, so longer range. Uh, obviously those are needed for something like the semi, um, where you know, every, every unit of mass that you add in battery pack, you have to subtract in cargo. So you, it's very important to have a mass efficient and long range uh, pack for, for batteries. Um, however, what we're seeing with uh, our that passenger vehicles is that our powertrain efficiency and uh, sort of tire efficiency, you know, drag coefficient, like basically all of the th things that, like, you know, our HVAC uh, go, going to a heat pump, um, basically our, our total vehicle efficiency has gotten good enough with uh, Model 3, for example, that we actually are comfortable having an iron phosphate battery pack in Model 3 in China, um, and you know and that that'll be in volume production later this year. Um, so we think that you know getting a range uh, that is in the high 200s, uh, you know, basically, but we think you probably get a, a range of almost 300 miles uh, with an iron phosphate pack, taking into account a whole bunch of uh, of powertrain and other vehicle efficiencies, um, and, and that that frees up a lot of capacity for things like the Tesla Semi, you know, other projects that require higher energy density. You have like two two supply chains that you can tap into: iron phosphate or or, or nickel. Um, we use very little cobalt in, in in our system already, and that's that may trend, you know, to zero long. So it's just really about nickel. I talked about lithium iron phosphate in at least two previous videos, my super battery video and my Cybertruck battery video. Lithium iron phosphate batteries are going to matter a lot. They allow Tesla to have two different types of batteries. They allow Tesla to use the lower energy density batteries in applications that don't require higher energy, high energy density. Semi requires high energy density. Roadster, Plaid Model S. The uh, Super Cybertruck, the, the Trimobre Cybertruck, they're going to require the high density batteries. But for a lot of vehicles and for storage, for grid storage, they don't need energy density. They can shift to lithium iron phosphate. It's cheaper, it has longer cycle life, and it frees up nickel for the other applications that need it. This is a huge, huge change. It's a big jump. And I'm going to brag about it. I called it in two different videos. Check out my super batteries videos. It's the most popular video I made. Check out my Cybertruck battery video. I talked about lithium iron phosphate in the low end Cybertrucks. 
using lithium iron phosphate is going to free up nickel and that makes everything a lot easier for Tesla to grow. Tesla recently decided not to produce standard range version of Model Y, no longer offers, uh, offers a standard range Model S or X and has announced ramping of the semi. Does this shift from smaller pack vehicles suggest that Tesla is not battery constrained as in the past? What are the biggest constraints now? Well, I'd just like to reemphasize, emphasize, you know, any mining companies out there, please mine more nickel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wherever you are in the world, please mine more nickel and, and, and don't wait for nickel to go back to some long, some high point that you experienced some five years ago or whatever. Go for efficient, you know, as environmentally friendly nickel mining at high volume. If Tesla will give you a con giant contract for a long period of time, <laughs> if you m mine nickel efficiently and in, in an environmentally sensitive way. <laughs> so, hopefully, this message goes out to all mining companies. Uh, please get nickel. <laughs> with re with regard to passenger vehicles, uh, I, th I think the new normal for range is going to be just in U.S. EPA terms, you know, approximately 300 miles. I think people will really come to expect that as, you know, some number close to 300 miles as, as normal, you know, that, that, that's a standard expectation. Because you do need to take into account, like, you know, is it very hot outside or very cold or, you know, are you driving up a tall mountain with, with a full load? You know, people don't want to have a you know, get get to the destination with like 10 miles of range. They, they want some regional, reasonable margins. I think 300 is going to be really, or close to 300 is going to be the new normal. You know, call it 500 kilometers, basically. That was a really big deal. A lot of people think Tesla is going to be advancing to 500 miles of range, 600 miles of range, 800 miles of range. The standard is going to be 300 miles of range. That's the target. That's the goal. Very few people need more than 300 miles of range most of the time. It's going to be good enough. The value is making more vehicles with, you know, using, you have a limited battery constraint. You want to use those batteries and spread them out and produce more vehicles, not produce fewer longer range vehicles, more shorter range vehicles. This last question is about insurance. Tesla insurance is really important for advancing the mission or particularly for the robo taxi network and for making Tesla vehicles more attractive to people who want to own cars, because if you can get the insurance less expensive because of the benefits of a Tesla, then you're going to want to buy more Teslas. More people will want to buy Teslas if they can get insurance. That's what is the holdup for Tesla insurance outside of California? Will you release numbers uh, from that part of the business? Will Tesla insurance be required to participate in the Tesla ride hailing network as a driver? Um, we are working super hard on insurance. Uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail here than I have on the past. But, uh, currently, we have a product in California, as I've described before, it's been quite well received, and um, I, I would largely describe it as a fairly standard insurance product with elements of it that are unique to our cars. So you can think of it as a, a version one of Tesla insurance. Um, yeah, well, version 0 0.9 in the beginning, at least. 0 yeah. 0.9. Yeah. <laughs> what, what we're working on now um, is we can call it version two, or we can call it the first version of our telematics product. Yeah. And so really, ultimately, where we want to get to with Tesla Insurance is to be able to use the data that's captured in the car, uh, in the driving profile of the person in the car, to be able to assess correlations and probabilities of crash, and, and be able then to assess a premium on a monthly basis for that customer. And uh, what makes this very exciting for us is the, the amount of data that is available with the customer's permission to use uh, is is not available in any other product or any other vehicle in the world. This gives us a unique advantage in terms of information. And you know, we have a decision point here where we could take the California product and replicate that into other states, or we could delay, delay going into additional states and instead put more effort into the telematic side of this. And, and we chose the latter. And where we are now is um, nearly complete with the uh, risk and cost analysis associated with the first version of the telematics product. We hope to be filing that in a handful of states with regulators very shortly. And uh, assuming that regulatory approvals go uh, smoothly, 
we hope to have this uh, in a handful of states by the end of the year. Just really quick in case you missed that, they're expecting to roll out the next generation of Tesla insurance in multiple states by the end of the year. And that's not Elon time. That's Zach time. That's real time. We're looking at a major change by the end. And, um, and then it will continue to file for approval in additional states. With regulatory approval there, we'll continue to roll this out nationwide as quickly as we can. And then that product, as we continue to collect more data and we iterate on it, will be version 2, version 3, et cetera, as we continue to refine that. Yeah, I mean, at, at the heart of, of being competitive with insurance is what is the accuracy of your information? Like, are you dealing with, are, 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 you, are you forced to assess people statistically looking in the rear view mirror, or can you uh, assess people individually uh, looking ahead with, uh, with, with smart projections and inform the, the, the driver that, that of, of how they may reduce their, what, what actions they can take to reduce their insurance. Um, as Zach was alluding to, it's like, if, okay, you're driving too fast, you're, you know, doing this, that, or the other thing. It's like, if you, if you want to pay more for insurance, you can, uh, but if you want to pay less, uh, please don't drive so crazy. Then <laughs> people can make a choice. Like, okay, they want to drive aggressively in the case, it'll be higher, higher insurance, or you're more careful in the driving, and it'll be pay, pay less. This is not a completely new concept. We actually had progressive snapshot on our cars. It measured hard braking. That was it. It didn't really measure much else. And they were able to assess insurance rates based on how often you broke hard because people who have more hard braking events are more likely to have more crashes. But Tesla is gonna be able to have much more data, much richer data to evaluate dangerous driving behaviors or slightly more risky driving behaviors or safer driving behaviors and they'll be able to price your insurance more accurately for you and encourage you, just as this progressive thing did, encourage you to drive in a manner that reduces the risk of crash. It's also actually very helpful for us to have a feedback loop to see what is driving insurance expense. A lot of it is just, it's like, um, you know, like a little fender bender and the net fender bender because of the way that the body collision repair was being done, you know, cost like, Fifteen thousand dollars or something crazy, and we're like, well, how? and and then we can actually adjust the design of the car and adjust how the repair is done to actually have the fundamental cost of solving that problem be less. So this this has helped us unearth a, a whole bunch of silly things that we were doing basically um, without realizing it. Um, which is this is the problem with in general with insurance is like if, if the insurance is like all you can eat, then it, the feedback loop for improvement is weak. So uh, this, this gives us a great feedback loop for improvement. It gives us basically a fundamentally better insurance product. Um, I'd also like to say, this, on, in the spirit of recruiting, because if, if there's one thing I'd like to come out of this call, it's um, that a, a lot of great people want to join Tesla. That's the number one thing I'd like out of this call. Um, and on the insurance front, I want to be clear, we're, we're building a great, like a major insurance company. Um, if you're interested in revolutionary insurance, please join Tesla. I would love to have some high energy actuaries, especially. I have great respect for the actuarial profession. Uh, your guys are great at math. Uh, please join Tesla, especially if you want to change things <laughs> and you're annoyed by how slow the, the industry is. This is the place to be. We want, we want revolutionary actuaries. <laughs> So there was a second part of this question, will Tesla insurance be required to participate in, in the Tesla ride hailing network? And so um, I think I've answered this before in prior calls, but by the time the ride hailing network is available, we will, Tesla insurance coverage will be provided for yeah. folks who are in this network. Yeah. Um, it, it's a different type of insurance because of the use of the car. Uh, it, it's not decided whether third party insurance versus Tesla insurance will be required. There might be some things we need to think through there. But Tesla insurance at least will be working, yeah. working for the ride hailing network. So there's some big hints from Elon about the roadmap for Tesla's future. You're going to see more cars. You're going to see more batteries. Tesla insurance is going to be everywhere. Semi's coming. Cybertruck is coming. And of course, Tesla Texas is coming. You're going to have factories on, in Asia. You're going to have factories and two, two sets of factories in North America, factory in Europe. A lot of great stuff coming. If you like this video, please subscribe. The content of this video, if you like the content of this video, my super batteries video, one of the best videos I made, check it out. 
other great videos you can watch. I'm covering a lot of content and I got a lot more coming, so please subscribe. Thanks for watching.